All right, for our next assignment, assignment six, we are gonna create a logo slash graphic symbol, and we're gonna do it for a purpose. So there are lots and lots of tutorials online or articles because logo design and what's called identity design or branding is something digital artists get asked to do all the time. Um, it really doesn't matter what your background in digital art is. Someone will ask you at some point to, <laughs> to design a brand for them. And we're going to, to use this to learn a new program, which is Adobe Illustrator. And basically, the guides to logos, there's a bunch of variety of approaches. But they need to be versatile, they need to be clear, and they need to be effective, right? So sometimes logos will incorporate a lot of text. This is what we call a logo type. Sometimes they will only be an image. Let's see if we have one that's only an image anywhere. Only an image would be an iconic logo, like this, right? Like these. Um, very often they are centrally composed. And then sometimes they'll play with the positive and the negative space. So a very famous example is the arrow in the FedEx logo, where it not it is not only using the, the actual logo itself or the symbol itself, but it's using the space around it to tell a different story. Now, simplicity is pretty key. So let's look at the Twitter logo, which is something I, I played with and modified last semester. If they used a bird like this, the big problem with it is as it scales, as it gets smaller and smaller, used for like a business card or used for something, you know, not this large, we would lose all the definition on the feet and the legs, and it just wouldn't be as readable, right? So instead you want that kind of indication of texture, but it becomes just the scalloping of the beak and the, and the feathers of the wing, and that helps it stand out. Now, sometimes we mistake good logo design for textures and lighting and kind of trendy finishes, right? Like when they were making all the, the new Batman superhero movies, they changed the old iconic Batman logo and made it out of cutout metal, right? And then they did the same thing for Transformers. And then they did something similar for the Superman movie, you know. And those are the special effects we add on top. And those aren't a bad idea. Sometimes those can work well. Sometimes they can make it feel new and exciting. But it's the bones underneath, the simple shapes, the simple you know, color choices, the simple arrangement of, of visual attributes that are going to make it successful. So basically, you want to think of your, your design for your graphic symbol or for your logo as just the black cutout. And then think of that black cutout as having lots and lots of different variations that are possible. You can put a rainbow gradient on it. You can put a drop shadow behind it. You can make it glow. You can give it an internal piping, an outline. All of that's a possibility, but first of all, you just need to get a good cutout shape. So what are the, the three approaches I want you to know for logo design? There's some basic things I want you to remember. And that is that your logo should be clear, effective, and versatile, right? So that's what we're going to work on. Now, we are working on a theme because we want, in order to make something that is effective, we have to decide what the purpose of it is, right? This isn't art for art's sake. Logo design, graphic symbols are in a world of commerce. They have a reason for communicating clearly. So to be clear and effective, we need to know what we're trying to do. And for this semester, this is our service learning project for the semester. We are supporting the campus activities for Earth Day 2019, which is in April. And we're going to have an exhibit of our work, which is titled Embat uh, Our Embattled Earth, which is a theme chosen by Art Club. So I put the theme up on the board. We are now thinking, how can we elaborate on that theme and give it a visual that helps uh, have some impact. So I keep a pretty extensive 
catalog of found images that's always growing. This used to be called a morgue. For illustrators, we would keep files of like fire hydrants and of depictions of the globe, you know, and depictions of hands, things like that. Now we just keep lots and lots of digital files from found sources. Mostly they're, they're public domain or Creative Commons sources or ones that have lapsed and fallen out of copyright. Um, but this is an image from some Japanese uh, design work that I've just always loved. And because I've been collecting these images for so long, I have so many images just floating in my mind that when I go out to sketch something, it's very often already relating to, to inspirations I've seen. So my idea was to do something like this, to show the R embattled earth as kind of the globe teetering on man's hand. Because what is the battle that's being waged over the earth? It's, it's not so much whether climate change is happening or not, it's whether man has any impact on it or not. And it's very easy to say man doesn't have impact on it because then you just say, well, we can't, we can't do anything to fix it, right? But if you do think that man has impact on it, which almost all scientists do, then, then you have this battle not just with what, does, what can man do to fix it, but also what can man do to convince other men that, or other humans that we can make a difference, right? So it's showing kind of the power and the hubris of man over the earth, but also I want to show it kind of precarious. You know, it's spinning, but it, it looks kind of dizzy. And, and maybe I'll add a little bit of tilt to it and a little bit of uh, uncertainty to it spinning on its axis. Because really, what are we talking about when you're talking about climate change and environmentalism? Uh, very quickly, it becomes, you know, the, the future of the planet and the future of our life on it. So these are, these are kind of epic themes I wanted to get across. Now, by being inspired by these past graphics, you can see that they are very line-based, and that's, that might change in order to turn them into a, a really versatile logo. This one is focusing more on, I don't know, the ballistic missiles or something. But it's a, a small little detail we're looking at, whereas this one is more holistic, right? So let's look at the different approaches to design in general for something like a graphic symbol. And this is something I do a lot of for the school. So I'm just going to sketch this out, and maybe this will mirror some of the sketch work you're doing. But I'm going to show you the three main approaches I want you to think about. And very often for an idea, I'll put them through all three approaches. So it's my way of kind of thumbnailing for a concept. And it's actually a whole lot easier to make a graphic symbol or a logo for your portfolio when you're given an assignment, you know, you're given a reason for it, than just to do one, just to do one, right? It's very hard to come up with a graphic symbol for yourself, you know, for your digital art portfolio without having done it before towards something other, like a dog walking company that your friend is starting or your friend's band or something like that. So that's why uh, I choose this one to give us a theme. So, what I would like you to do in your sketchbook, even though I've already wanted you thinking and coming up with sketches, is to just really quickly interrogate your idea. And this is, this is how. At the top of the sketchbook page, I want you to put the theme. Because this is our design assignment. This is our brief. And the theme is our, or our, embattled earth. I'm going to take the resolution on this down a little bit because it's taking a while. Now, what's nice about writing the theme, not only do you have it as, as a reminder and reference at the top of your sketchbook, but then you're also thinking of them as individual words, and you might want to focus on something in particular. All these updates are really slowing down my computer. 
And we'll close things I don't need. So the three approaches I mentioned, the first is what's called central symmetrical. And this is what most of us think of. This is kind of the most cliched, but in many ways, the most effective. And central symmetrical means that it's like a target. OK, good. It's starting to catch up with me now. So if we think of the target logo, it is definitely a central symmetrical logo, right? The eye is drawn right to the middle, just like a target. Pretty bad sketch of it. What if we think of the CBS logo? Same thing, they just use an eye, something like that, right? Think of the AT&T logo, which they're always doing tiny little changes to, which I find really annoying. But at its core, it is this, right? What does central symmetrical mean? It means that the logo basically contains a symmetrical shape. So you can think of it as a square or a circle. And the eye is meant to just go right to the middle of it, like big crosshairs, and it's meant to stay there. This is also how the Apple logo works. Right. So what don't you have? What's the downside of this approach? You don't have any kind of dynamic movement. You don't have the eye kind of speeding up. It's a very clear eye movement. And the general problem is the eye goes into it, it takes it in, and then it imme immediately jumps out of it. Right? But it's incredibly effective. Let's look at it, the next approach. The next approach. I'm going to get that theme up there, is to try to prioritize for, for movement and the eye being engaged and excited in its experience of it. So the experience of the logo itself, itself is more uh, engaging. And so a dynamic approach tries to prioritize movement. And you do that by using not horizontals and verticals, but by using diagonals and curves. So a dynamic graphics symbol design. <laughs> Come on. There we go. Would be like the Nike swoosh. Right. And whether you like these logos, you know, the Mac logo, the Nike logo, whether you like them or not, doesn't really matter. They are incredibly influential. So these are the ways we get used to seeing branding. And because it's the way we're used to seeing it, it keeps getting used and it keeps becoming synonymous with, with a symbol for a larger idea. So when our eye looks at this, our eye just immediately kind of sweeps across it and moves. So it never gets locked into a center, right? Now, what if we played with kind of symmetrical balance? So what if Nike's new logo balance them like this. Even that's still dynamic, right? Because it still leads our eye across and through. And because we're a Western culture, we tend to read things top to bottom, left to right. And so our eye movement's always going to leave the image off the right side. But look how different that is than this. This uses horizontals and verticals. And the problem with horizontals and verticals is that they slow eye movement. So this feels central and symmetrical. Our eye actually goes into the middle here and then jumps out rather than being engaged by those arrows. So it's the curves and diagonals that are really doing the job. So that's a dynamic logo approach. Now the third type 
is play.